afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and uh, a great privilege to speak here today before these distinct personalities and oversee at Overseas Development Institute, ODI. This is an institute home of UK's leading independent think tank and international development on international development and humanitarian issues. An organization that works with partners in the public and private sectors in both developing and developed countries, bringing to our attention year after year high quality applied research, practical policy advice, as well as policy focused dissemination and debate. I begin by expressing my profound gratitude to ODI for kindly inviting me to this beautiful and historical seat of London to speak here at the 2013 Cape Conference, budgeting in the real world. What do we know? What should we do? This conference covers a classic but contemporary topic, which has evolved together with the evolution of societies. To address this ever-changing and fascinating topic, I will look at the specific reality of my country, the case of Mozambique. The budget is a key policy instrument to implement economic, social, and political agenda of a country. The budget materialized the manifestos and promises of the governments. And at the same time, it is a tool that implements long and medium term policies of different nations. Therefore, the budget has two main responsibilities. On one hand, it implements the political agenda of four to five years mandate of the government. And on the other hand, it has to implement medium and long-term visions and dreams of the people. This dichotomy makes the budget become an instrument in which the different national and social interests converge or diverge. In the classic version, the budget characterizes the use of resources available in the country at a certain period of time, normally one year. So the figures reflected the resources, uh, the resources of the previous year with small and slight adjustments in the current year. Nowadays, every budget represents a specific political, economic, and social reality. It is the budget that shows whether a country is at peace or it is at war. I had that experience in Mozambique in 1994 when we prepared the first budget after the peace agreement and after the general elections. We had to take decision, immediate decisions about the military expenditures to show that the budget, it is the mirror of the country. So we had to show that there is no more war in the country. We couldn't afford to keep the resources that were allocated to military. It's a difficult decision, but has to be taken on time and immediately when there is enthusiasm about the peace. Two or three years later, it's not possible to take that decision. The other uh, situation that the budget can show is that if the country is stable or unstable. If a country believes that the state has a responsibility to create a conducive environment for the private sector to flourish, the budget has to show that. If a country has a strong or weak social policy in relation to its citizens, the budget has to show that. Therefore, over the time, the systems of preparing the budget have evolved. They have evolved accordingly to the historical evolution of the countries in the world. In fact, without break of the international financial crisis, we note that high volumes of the state budget were set to address the deficit and bankruptcies of <coughs> the financial institutions. So those budgets show that there was a financial crisis. We notice that in the US and Europe and some Asian countries like Japan. 
After this initial reaction to the crisis, the budgets of these countries started to show signals of investment and for economic recovery. Now that they are signs of recovery, the budgets demonstrate, demonstrate one approach of reduction in public expenditure and social benefits. So there are cuts in social benefits. This is a painful but necessary path to face the problem of sovereign debt and get the necessary investment to grow economically. The scenarios of these countries have, have shown a national vision that focuses on the sustainability of the public spending. This vision will allow these countries to implement a more robust mm -hmm. and sustainable economic development agenda. So I wish them good luck. It's not easy. With regard to developing countries such as Mozambique, the budget is reflect the political, economic, and social evolution over time. Thus, we can group the evolution of the Mozambican budget in three phases. The first phase, I would say, until 1995. The second, uh, what I would call the classic phase mm -hmm. of the budget in Mozambique. The second phase of reconstruction in the macroeconomic stabilization from 1995 to 2004. And the third phase, the phase of pursuing sustainable development, the 2005 budget onward. In the so-called Mozambican classic phase, the budget was prepared looking to the previous and current year indicators. These figures were based on the expected, expected additional revenue. We would update the spending of the year in preparation, looking to the inflation. There were not many variations between the budget of the current year and the previous one, neither between the next year and the current year. So just add the inflation and some additional revenues on each of the categories. This period counts up until 1995 when we lived in an environment of war in which the budget was mainly channeled to the military spending. The budget indicators were clearly of a country at war. The largest volume of expenditure was allocated to the defense and security. At that period of time, Mozambique was facing uh, persistent humanitarian emergency situation due to natural disasters, drought, and floods. During this period, the volume of, the volume of uh, resources allocated to education, health, water supply, infrastructure, agriculture, and justice system correspond to the minimum mm. necessary to keep this institution running in an environment of emergency and war. So 50% of the education network and uh, more than 60% of the health network were destroyed. So we had to run only the minimum of this sector. With the signing of the general peace agreement and the end of the war, the reconstruction uh, started. We had two main challenges, the reconstruction and stabilization program. As I said yesterday, when we finished the, the war, the inflation rate in 1994 was uh, around 76% end of period. So we had to choose both of them. We couldn't afford to choose one or the other. This was the most difficult decision. It was necessary to rely on three key factors. First of all, divisional leadership of uh, President Chisano at that time. And second, the resilient, persistent, and hardworking Mozambican people. And third, a consistent and long-standing cooperation and solidarity of the international community. Thanks to the combination of these three factors, rapidly Mozambique moved on to the new phase. So we did the reconstruction in less than 10 years. And we moved to the expansion of education, health, network. In 1995, we started the stabilization process in the environment of national reconstruction and peace. The budget indicators reflected the prioritization in health, education, justice, agriculture, and rebuilding the economic infrastructure. 
the process of poverty alleviation also restarted. The budget for education had an evolution of 13 to 22 percent until 2009. For health, we moved from 8 percent to 14 percent. In agriculture, from 4 to 11 percent. Infrastructure, from 7 to 17 percent. In addition, a substantial enhancement was given to justice system. It was not easy to create a consensus around the agenda of development. What should come first? It was a difficult discussion. This budget reflected clearly the development agenda of the country. We would make reforms while rebuilding. We would stay committed politically and economically to the Millennium Development Goals. The first tip that I would like to share with you is that during this period of time where you have to make the tough and difficult decision, a tight uh, collaboration and coordination with the leadership of the country is very important and discussion among the ministries. The Minister of Finance has to promote this kind of discussion and collaboration from the colleagues. During this time, the consensus regarding with the, which agenda should be developed was fundamental. The confidence building between the different stakeholders was a critical issue. Indeed, this process of building trust led us to change from a project approach to a budget support approach. For this to happen, we went from program support uh, system to the settle-wide approach. So while we were changing our procedures in the budget, we had to discuss with the donors the way how they were channeling the resources to the country. In 2004, under the principles of the Rome Declaration, we signed with the international partners a memorandum of understanding on budget support. With great emotion, we called this memorandum the Miraculous Memorandum. To see uh, France uh, and uh, other countries embark on budget support, it was not something they would dream so soon, but it happened. When the international partners gave up direct control of the budget circle in terms of preparation, approval, execution, procurement, disbursement, accountability, auditing of the project and programs, including its monitoring, it showed the high level of trust and confidence they had gained in the Mozambican reform process. They passed on the responsibility of the Mozambican government who claimed ownership to the Mozambican government who claimed ownership of this whole budget process. The international partners would support the process of monitoring together with us and monitor also the result. I remember when I went to Rome to for a round, round table in 2000 when we had those huge floods in Mozambique and asked for around uh, $450 million for reconstruction. Uh, the Minister of Development and Cooperation of uh, Holland, Evelyn Hengis, she made an uh, intervention saying, well, I'm going to give you $45 million, but I'll not decide where to put this money. You are the Minister of fin Planning and Finance of the country. I trust you, I trust the government, so you have the $45 million, you, you decide whatever you have to do. Well, um, when I arrived in Maputo, I called the ambassador of Holland, I said, what are we going to do with this money? <laughs> <laughs> he said, minister, but my minister said that you are the one deciding. I said, okay, he said that, but let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> It was high responsibility, so we couldn't fail. So I said, okay, let's see if we do in just one sector so we can control better. He said, okay, I agree with you. So which sector? I said, what's your opinion? He said, no, you start. <laughs> <laughs> because you know my minister will not accept me defining what we are going to do. I said, let's rebuild schools, first of all. He said, I agree. And then I said, well, uh, so you are the one deciding how to make the procurement. He said, no, you are the one deciding it. I said, well. I said, okay, let's define teams, joint team. 
So we had the joint team, we did the procurement process and so on. We implemented the project and after 12 months, a team f came from Holland, we, we had a joint team of supervision and so on, and things really moved very well. So the confidence building was a very important process. In, th in this new process, we learned that the general state account was very important to ensure the alignment between intentions reflected in the budget and the real execution. And here, I have this tip number two. So we start by planning, and then we have the execution. Um, the confidence building has to be done in a way that we'll see that there is a reduction between uh, the, in the gap between the program and the execution of the budget in order to create this credibility for the government and for the team in the Ministry of Planning and Finance. So I do agree with the, what is reflected in the handbook, which states that improvement in the process of budgeting, together with efficient and strong financial management system, contribute for a multiple objective and contribute particularly to more efficient allocation of resources. So it was man mandatory that the reforms of the budgetary process had to continue in Mozambique. And uh, I really subscribe what the handbook says about this. It happened in Mozambique and that's the best way of starting the reforms. The high dependence on international aid was a key feature of the budget. Thus the reform in domestic revenues was an important factor in the agenda of reconstruction and change. This change had to be radical, but necessary, and they were very difficult. Because we start going to the private sector life. One was to reorganize the expenditures in the budget with the line ministries, with the provincial governments, and the central governments. The other thing is to go to the private sector and discuss the reform in revenues taxation, the kind of fiscal package to implement. So we had Crown agents working with us in custom, radical change, starting for, from each of the, the paramilitary uh, member of, of the custom. And I remember they, were, they had the brown uh, uniform and we introduced blue uniform. Mm. So you will you pass through this process of scrutiny and uh, training, and when you pass in that process, you become blue instead of brown. <laughs> <laughs> and they were so proud of wearing the blue. And they were saying, do you, are you wearing, you still wearing the brown? What's <laughs> going on with you? <laughs> so uh, this process of putting the young uh, generation in the process of change and reform was, was amazing, was very tough. But we faced also other kind of problems in terms of corruption that we had to take decision. Tip number three in this reform process of uh, uh, custom and internal revenues. Keep close and tight close to the private sector. Create personal relationship with the head of the Confederation of Economic Association and uh, the association in, in private sector. Have personal dialogue with the private sector. Otherwise, it will not happen. They can make sabotage. So it's important to keep this relation. The dysfunction between what was predicted and what was executed was a constant concern. The reasons were political and technical. So to better address the political difficulties, it was necessary to eliminate the technical weakness in the legislation, processing, and human capacity. I really like very much that uh, uh, approach that was done during the previous uh, panel mm -hmm. on the human capacity, the role of the human capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and here I have tip number four. Start resolving what is directly from your responsibility. The technical issue, the leadership in the ministry, it's your own responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the political side you can share with the head of state and he will help you. But your job has to be done. Tip number four. 
on the political base on the political based on my own experience there are two main fig three main figures that you have to take in consideration the head of state and government for the case of Mozambique the parliament you have to create a very good relation of the head with the head of bank aid because the ruling party is the one deciding the agenda of the day the agenda of the year for the parliament you have so many bills to put in the parliament they have to pass fast and they are painful bills because they are not popular <coughs> and the parliament doesn't like to take unpopular decisions so keep this relation with with the head of bank aid in order to pursue the reforms and finally the minister of finance and planning has to have the capacity of moving fast very fast reforms and transformation are two different things the reform has to be fast transformation can happen as a process but reform is a decision to make change and change has to be fast tip number six you have to start with the raising stars in the ministry because when you do the, re the reforms you have to rely to what you have available those are the people that you have in the institution and you start the reform with those people but you have one responsibility to change the situation for the future mm. because you could change the past you have an heritage so you have to follow what you have available and work with what you have available but you are not entitled to keep the situation as it is so make a change in terms of way how the raising star mm. comes and i like the question that was made by the lady from i think kosovo or kazakhstan kazakhstan yeah um in, Mo in mozambique in miso planning finance i did in a very very innovative manner and i don't know how i was inspired to do that what i did was to ask each director to bring all the people that had uh, uh, university level just like that have a meeting in each directorate with them know the faces what they are doing interact with them in each key directorate i did that in one month each directorate discuss with them keep the, the relation with them and then advise the director to pick two or three of them and tell him never come to your office discuss with you strategies without those three guys and during this process from the three guys you get one or two real raising stars and you invest on them uh, i had to create a new organ in the ministry it was not in the rules of the ministry you have the consultative meeting where those traditional directors are there very powerful uh real bubble trees yeah <laughs> but they are bubble trees in reality so you keep that consultative meeting it's fine but i create what i call technical meeting and in the technical meeting they will be it will be mandatory to come with two raising stars and who makes the presentation of technical and the reforms issues is the one of the raising stars and the director is obliged to support them in this process it's not easy because they will try to come say ah it's not available <laughs> it's not you say okay we are not going to analyze your proposal and you're out of the process of of the matrix of implementation you are failing the matrix so please bring your people and let's discuss this and after several meetings you start rewarding the director that he's performing better of bringing raising stars and they will compete among themselves and defend the raising stars during the meetings so when you achieve that stage you can start thinking about replacing but take your time because they are performing they are doing the job what i realized in the minister of planning finance after five years as a minister of planning finance i left the minister of planning finance with those raising stars i went to my office as a prime minister and one day when i went to visit the minister of planning and finance i realized that 98 percent mm. of the national directors of that ministry were those raising stars that i left mm -hmm. in the ministry mm. 
So it was sustainable. And now when I was discussing with a friend of Mozambique, they were giving me names of those raising stars. Mm -hmm. Because the other ones have retired, and we have now new blood in the ministry. So uh, the type of Minister of Finance that is required for this phase is a visionary leader, one who can lead difficult processes, such as the reform of public finance and management, and at the same time, keep the team cohesive and determined. It is required a minister who is not afraid of saying no to the president in private. Being, he has to be a minister that uh, likes to be surrounded by competent experts and new blood in the ministry. A minister who involves all medium level decision, decision makers and employees in the transformation process. I remember one very specific case that I had in Mozambique about this issue of evolving all the levels. I did by conviction, but I didn't know that it was so important at the end of the day. When we were doing the most difficult reforms of uh, budget execution, we had to create the single, uh, the treasurer single account. Single treasurer Sing account. Yeah, single treasurer account. So we had to replace all this is old fashioned system that we were feeding corruption and so on in public sector and in private sector. They were all eating from that system. So they were all in combination, try to keep business as usual. <laughs> S 24 hours before we made the replacement, with everything organized and settled, the most uh, trustable, the, 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 the major advisor of the ministry, the one that uh, I used to discuss everything, came to my office, he said, Minister, cancel the implementation of this <laughs> measure tomorrow. Because all will be against you. I said, why? No, all, we, all of them will be against you. So I said, oh, let's look to the all. Where are the all? <laughs> and I was looking around. I didn't see any all. <laughs> I said, let's make the list of the all. <laughs> Start from the ministry. We have the directors. We have the provincial ones. And we have to the district level. Let's make a, a teleconference with them. And I call all of them for teleconference. When I start making introductory remarks that are a little bit reluctant, one of them said, Minister, where are you going? Because uh, from what you're saying, it seems that you are not going to implement tomorrow <laughs> the measure that we prepared for more than a year. I said, well, I'm thinking on this. No, 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 no. Minister, this is a reform for yesterday. We are already in the country. 11 provincial directors plus the digital directors. They said that because they were involved in the process and they were anxious to change the, the situation. And they said, well, one of the all is out. So let's go to the second wall. We call the private sector. I said private sector, we have this system. Those are the advantage and disadvantage of this system. We have the new system. What do you think? Said, oh, Minister, we have been working together for more than a year on this issue and discuss it. So I think tomorrow is the day to implement it. We don't understand what's going on. Are you saying that you are not going to implement? So all this process of corruption so on will continue? You have been telling us that this is the best. So now you're saying we, we will do business as usual? We have to put aside the amount of money to pay the corruption in order to get our payments? <laughs> I said, oh, the second all is out. <laughs> so let's go to the third wall. <laughs> the third wall was ministries. Call me, my colleagues. Emergency meeting. We spent almost 24 hours doing meetings because I had to wait for the day. So I, had, I did the video conference, I did the emergency meeting with the directors, emergency meeting with private sector representatives, emergency meeting with the ministers, sectoral ministers. I said, what do you think? I said, no, minister, please, let's do it. So I said, well, do you have another all? 
<laughs> he said, no. I said, okay, so tomorrow we implement. He said, it's better, Minister. We should implement it. So, okay. <laughs> so we did. Meaning that the involvement of all the levels, it is key for success. So I will jump some of the issues and go to some of the tips so I can give more time for interacting. So this is possible because everyone already knows the role in the process, the contribution, and so on. Starting from the central government to the provinces, districts, private sector, and civil society. Tip number seven. The reforms should be internally driven and externally supported. Can be external driven and internally supported. It will not work. So the reform is to start from inside. Mm -hmm. The need to reform. You have to feel internally. And this awareness doesn't appear from the heaven. The leader has to be the one, you know, provoking the reaction. And they will come with more contributions. Go looking to the weaknesses and support the, the, the leader to find the best solutions. And there you have the ex expertise from external uh, institutions, World Bank, IMF, ODI, and anyone that you can consult will bring new ideas and so on. But you are driving the reform. You have the external support. Otherwise, don't start it. You can make a mess and uh, be worse than before. Uh, for African countries like Mozambique, after more than a decade of economic growth, above 7% in terms of growth, the major concern that was placed in 2004 was how to ensure an inclusive, sustainable economic growth in the coming years. One of the nightmares that I used to have at that time, and I remember when I had the visit of Gordon Brown in Mozambique and uh, and uh, Prime Minister Blair also, when both of them visit me twice. Uh, actually, uh, Prime Minister Blair uh, landed the, the plane in a Beira uh, city, and uh, I was the guest of one of that flight. So uh, he's, he's a very good pilot. <laughs> and uh, well, um, the major concern that I had was how to keep the country growing in a sustainable manner. Because you have the peace dividend, you have the reforms, and then in Africa what happens, you grow, and then you have vicious circle. You come back to the previous situation. And you, you have uh, the crisis, the war, peace building, grow, and come back to the previous situation. So my major concern was how to make this growth sustainable. And in order to be sustainable, you have to have inclusive growth. The Human Development Index has to be there. <coughs> and the budget is the major instrument to achieve that. And this challenge has become more demanding with the international financial crisis and the emerging of new players in the international arena. The BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and uh, South Africa. That was the time when we start discussing not only about reforms, but also about economic transformation in Africa transformation of the economic and productive structure of the countries, like Mozambique, transformation to make economic growth sustainable and inclusive. Mozambique does not have yet the formula. We're still discussing in the country how to make this happen. And uh, some signs started to appear, and some measures <laughs> have been taken. And. Uh, the budget allocation of 7 million meticas for each district to transform the productive uh, base is one of the measures. The African Union declaration to allocate 10% of the budget to agriculture is another measure because the majority of our population, 70%, lives on agriculture uh, production. And the promotion of public and private partnership for infrastructure is also another measure. As the information that is being widely disseminated demonstrates, Mozambique is among of the top three natural gas reserves in the world. 
the revenue from these resources are not indifferent to the state budget. I liked when Antoinette uh, referred to the challenge of how to use these resources. Mozambique is one of the cases where we discuss a lot about this. So the state budget during the phase of sustainable development, it's not a budget in one hand, uh, it is a budget to, in one hand demonstrates a financial effort to allocate the funds to the key areas of poverty alleviation like education, health, infrastructure, agriculture, institution of justice, security, public order, good governance, and consolidation of democracy. And on the other hand, transversely allocate resources for environment and gender equity. The gender budget is being progressively experimented in Mozambique. Uh, tip number w number eight. I think it's nine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How to ensure the allocation to the priority sector? How to ensure that the other colleagues will agree with your proposal for the budget? First, discuss collectively, but it's not enough. Second, get involved on the discussion of the priority sector to ensure that they receive what they have to receive in terms of priority. The Minister of Finance himself. And third, bring the small ones with you. It's cheaper and you have an ally with very small amount of money. So I would no, never leave the Minister of Women Affairs, the Minister of, uh, of Youth out of, uh, of the agenda because they will help me to defend the budget in the <laughs> parliament, in the cabinet ministry. While the Minister of Defense uh, claims or the Minister of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs mm. uh, says something. Mm. So just last message. The question that arises now is how we can work in an organized manner looking to the priorities with the, a situation where we have the new blocks like BRICS. What will be the situation for DA for the budgets of these developing countries? And what is the role of the most domestic revenues coming from natural resources? For the case of Mozambique, my humble opinion is that the budget as a key instrument for economic policy, reflects what each country has to make as an option. First, that's too early to forget ODA has the, one of the sources to cover the needs of the budget. Mozambique still needs the support from ODA. More than 40% of the budget comes from ODA. The BRICS are not the magic solution for de developing countries, but they are increasingly important. So it is important to influence the upside in terms of financing our countries. Instead of choosing whatever they want to finance, they have to embark mm -hmm. in the global agenda of the country. The natural resources such as minerals have not yet complied with their role of benefiting the society and the budget. But we have to prepare the legislation, the regulations, uh, in order to accommodate uh, a fair distribution of profits from these mineral resources. I have no doubt that we can not continue doing business as usual after the financial crisis. So everything should be done in order to make the budget more efficient, first of all, in terms of allocation of resources, and we have to make the budget more uh, rational in terms of uh, decision in the allocations of the resources that are available. So the budget cycle for our expenditure allocation should uh, impose the efficiency and uh, priority settling 
and the revenues have to be done in a way to use these different windows of opportunity from national resources and abroad. This would be my contribution in terms of uh, presentation and I would like to congratulate once again the 2013 Cape Conference, budgeting in the real world for addressing such an important and key topic which is fundamental in development process of our countries and our lives. And I wish you all productive conference and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>